Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Barry Kostrinsky, president of the Artist Talk on Art, the ATOA. ATOA has been around since 1975, presenting talks on the arts in New York City at various locations on the Lower West Side of New York City. We're a 501c3, and these talks that are online, these Zoom talks that we've been doing weekly for about a year and a month or two now, um, is something different. We will be going back to our in-person talks and a mix of Zoom talks, but that's to come. What we have now is we have a presentation organized by Mitch Pilnick. Mitch is a board member of the Artist Talk on Art. He's put together many talks. And let me say, if anybody listening here would like to present a talk, uh, be part of a talk, reach out to me. You'll see our information on our website, atoanyc.org and every, everything to know about us, our calendar and what's to come as well. Um, so thank you, Mitch. Mitch will be giving a light introduction in a moment. I just wanna say we are a 501c3. If you'd like to contribute, again, the information is on the web. A lot of people have sent in money recently and I just wanna thank you. We just made a deposit. So thank you very much. Um, and as well, I'd like to recognize uh, Roberta Bernardi, a board member of the Artist Talk on Art here. And of course, Doug Shear, a founding member of the group, uh, going back to 1975 and still an active board member. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, three artists presenting, Arlene Rush, Kate Fovell, and Bob Clyatt. Mitch, I'm gonna hand it to you. Um, thank you again, Mitch. Again, thank you to all the artists who are gonna present tonight. And thank you to everybody. Uh, feel free to comment at any time, but also feel free to mute yourself when the artists are talking, just so you don't have to worry we hear, if we hear your background. Uh, thanks, thanks, Mitch, again, and welcome. Well, it's nice to be doing these, and I look forward to the day when we get back to our uh, brick and mortar talks, but this has been great. Uh, first of all, I want to start off, because the first artist I had reached out to was Arlene. And I probably know Arlene since, uh, I would say, about seven or eight years. I was thinking, Arlene, say, of like, how, how did I first meet you? And I'm thinking probably in a show that you did in Harlem, because I used to spend oh, a lot of time in Harlem. It could have been. Yeah. Uh, you hear, yeah. Um, I'm just looking at my resume. 2014, I think it was, when I did some shows in Harlem and I was at the Schomburg Center. Um, so I was in a really incredible show there. Uh, uh, honoring there was, another, there was another one that was like a, either a gallery or a pop-up yeah, that I remember. It was, a, it, it was a gallery that was uh, the Long Gallery, uh, which was formerly uh, the Soul Studio. And Lewis, um, mm -hmm. Paul, wait, Paul, I think, it, yeah, Paul is his name. No, Lewis Paul. Mm -hmm. Oh boy, my dyslexia. But the owner of the gallery, he changed the name. But we did uh, in conjunction the celebration of Nazaki Shang um, at that gallery and uh, over at the Schomburg center um so he had a number of uh he he curated a number of shows there was another one at, that was in conjunction with that anniversary celebration and it was amazing i mean she passed away i think last year mm. but um she and wrote mitch, mitch uh the other artists uh kate and bob uh, yeah i just uh I just wanted to say yeah, very quickly as far as with Arlene, you know, as she will be showing you, her range is amazing. She puts so much meaning into her work. Um, but I applaud her not only as being an artist, but also political activist, as far as, you know, support of our current president, uh, being a cancer survivor, you know. 10 years today. Hey, congratulations. Yeah, I just awesome. got my uh, yes. results of my mammogram and sonogram today, just like That's a little great. while ago. So it's and, uh, exciting. Super. And uh, the way I came to know Kate 
was from the USPS uh, project through Christina that I had seen your work that was combined with cake, which was unbelievable USPS. What's the name? Chris, Christina that put that yeah. together was one of the best moments of, of the pandemic era. And Bob, who originally said, well, I don't have all the studio space, but for, I would say, what, a couple of years that uh, Arlene and then Bob were uh, uh, sharing a in uh, the Highline section. So I'll turn it over, but thank you. And then when Bob gets on later, thank you all for being here. It's really special. Thanks, Mitch. Yeah. Welcome, Arlene. Where, where are you coming in from? So I am right now in my studio. You could kind of see somewhere <laughs> behind me. <laughs> uh, and uh, which is in Chelsea, New York, for those who don't know me. And I have just a little intro about that. Been here in Chelsea since 1986. So definitely a pioneer in Chelsea, a pioneer as a woman artist that was a welder. Um, and I've been in this particular space, I think it's 27 years. So it's uh, sort of miraculous in New York City, Manhattan nowadays to have sustained oneself within uh, the same space. Uh, how long that will be, I have no clue. But right now I'm here, so. And I'm pretty grateful for that. Should I press share my share screen, Barry? Yes, that's the way to go. All right. So, um, hmm. why is it not happening this time? Maybe give it a minute. Oh, there it is. Uh, there, you go. there you go. Are you good? All right. Excellent. All right, the unfortunate part is I see you differently. So let me see if I could uh, change that because it gets, to, then my eyes look like they're like bopping around in the wrong place. And uh, let's see how I can make this better. All right, well, uh, this is how it's gonna be for looks now. Good, looks good from our side. All right, yeah, I, I always have a problem with Zoom with the fact that my eyes look like I'm looking in the not at people and I really hate that because I want to look at people and feel that connection. So I think this is okay. Uh, so uh, I just to let you know a little bit about me and Mitch said uh, my work uh, spans in many mediums and uh, and basically my work uh, addresses political, social ideas. I use a lot from living my life and observing what's happening in the world and wanting to have a conversation about it. For me, art is uh, a form of communication and I find it to be uh, a way of communicating things that people might not want to even talk about. So, uh, and bringing light to it. So, uh, and that's why it deals a lot with political feminist ide you know, ideology. Um, and so I'll bring you, you know, bring you up to date. I was a sculptor and only worked in steel to begin with. I worked with abstract art and I did indoor and outdoor pieces and eventually in around 90, Eight or 99, 1998, 99, I moved into more uh, conceptual work. And I will basically show you that work and take you through some of it. Uh, starting with, um, I'll start from more current and I'll work my way back. Uh, I'm dyslexic, so that's maybe <laughs> why it might be easier for me to do it and it's more current. So this piece right here, I'm still here, is my first animation NFT that I've done. I started dabbling with NFTs and I am 
was currently in that just came down um, Every Woman Biennial and it was at the Super Chief Gallery, which is the first gallery that exists to show NFTR. Um, this piece was taken from a print that I did back uh, when, as I was dealing with my Evidence of Being series that started in 2015. And I reworked the piece in, uh, from a print to an animation, which was very, uh, I'm still here, which has a lot, a lot of significance coming out of this pandemic or still being in the pandemic. And um, that was shown, uh, I guess last month or this, the beginning of this month, the beginning of this month at uh, Super Chief Gallery. Um, Moving along, and I'm going back to my current affairs series, uh, which the two series I kind of move in and out of is evidence of being in current affairs. And both of them deal with political socioeconomic uh, topics. And the current affairs started uh, prior to the 2000 and 16 election. It, my very first piece though started in, uh, I did in 2008, uh, Rush for President. My work was not political prior to that. And this piece called uh, Rush for President, I did this interactive piece for Rush Gallery, which is not related to me, just so happens that we have the same name. And this piece had importance even in the 2016 election, which was shown again at Bergen Community College. And uh, the piece deals, uh, well, I was actually, I made a, I was asked to do a proposal for a show called Everybody In. So I took the, uh, the gallery director and I, and this is when Hillary and Obama were running. And the, since the gallery director was a black man and a man, and I'm a white woman and a woman, and I'm an artist, he's a gallery director. I thought that the economy of two of it, putting it together and uniting it would uh, work very well in the theme of everybody in. And then I used the Betsy Ross flag, which, she designed with George Washington and it was a woman contributing in the design of a flag. And then looking closely, I don't, uh, the, the money was uh, contributed anonymously to the Kadapa World Peace Temple. So campaign donations, which is totally the opposite of what is happening now or happens in campaign uh, donations uh, was donated to World Peace Temple. And people collected the buttons, put in money, and it was uh, the gallery director, Derek Adams, who is a very renowned artist to himself now, uh, walked around the gallery campaigning for me. So that was one of the very first political pieces I did. And it was very successful and I loved doing it. And besides it being one of the most fun shows I was in. In 2016, I kind of knew, and this is called America 2006, zero to 2016. I knew after Trump even got to run, uh, not even elected that our system was failed, <laughs> just over. And uh, I did this piece, America 2000, a zero to 2016. And here I use a brass urn and vinyl lettering. And I use a lot of materials. So later on, if you wanna ask me about any of them, feel free to. Here, this had to do with the Women's March and uh, United We Stand and used an androgynous head, which is myself, did a pattern and I used some graphics and I used words 
in my work. I did this piece also for the Women's March and I also did this piece uh, out of uh, when after I was, I made this piece after I was diagnosed with breast cancer. So if anybody could recognize over that looks like tattoos, they're really marking uh, the markers they use when they take uh, do mammograms uh, and mark your body in certain ways so they could see in the mammogram uh, where there might be a scar or surgery or anything to look at. And this is woman rights or human rights. So uh, I had a lot of, uh, this was right after uh, the election, Farewell America. The date is down there, November 8th. Uh, this piece was done, but disassembled because it's too big, but it has a coffin like shape. And I do, um, just being a box, and I do uh, use urn-like, coffin-like boxes, shapes to represent death and, or even renewal. I probably have it in, for renewal also in places. Uh, this piece is gold leaf on a printed rag paper and vinyl lettering. The scale of my work varies, um, as you can see. You can see the thumbnails here. Um, there's resist that was happening in 2017. That was a word that came about in uh, many, uh, many times. This is I did in 2017 when our right to choose was being threatened. Um, this piece, uh, Who Killed Mandusa, this is a photograph I took in, uh, at the Met and I inserted Trump's head up here. I don't know if, how, if you could see it. And down here it says, that's what you get for grabbing pussy. So as you recall, and there's a tiny, tiny penis that I sculpted uh, down on the pillow. Uh, and uh, it pretty much speaks to it, it for itself. But we had a president that bragged about grabbing women. And to me, that was uh, pretty incredible. So here I have one that I did do not touch. And it has a vaginal piece sitting on the pillow. And his head is um, in there being cut. <laughs> um, moving along here, this piece, uh, a declaration, huh, which is, oh, here we go. Uh, I did for a show uh, in the Netherlands and um, I use old, I do a lot with old masters and I put my head on male and females to integrate the male, the gender that we both have in, inside of us. Like we're all male, we're not all male, we're not all female, we have a mixture. So it talks about identity. And just a background, I, I am a twin to a, a, a brother and I grew up as a tomboy and I dressed him as a girl and I played football and I boxed and I protected him and I had the best of both worlds and my family was okay with that. Society might not have been, but I, uh, I grew up in a way that did not talk about gender as being, um, having set roles. So a lot of my work, and that's why I work with identity and gender because society speaks differently of it. So I like to make a point of talking about it. Um, now, uh, so I did that piece for a show in the Netherlands actually. And uh, so here we have, uh, this is also uh, screaming out how voting is really important. So I use uh, crystals here, we have a unicorn, we have uh, 
for the next generation, like help the world vote for the next generation, make it a better place. Here, you can see the skull. Uh, I don't know if you can see the skull, but it's shredded money. Uh, everything represents something in my work. A lot of it is very thought provoking, but then some of it is subtlety. So it, when I use the glass skull, it was uh, initially I wanted to not have it be obvious that it was a skull, but maybe it's not obvious enough. You really have to look at the piece to see that money is pouring out of the skull. And it talks about you know, our society being all about money and commercialism and nothing to do about the people. Um, Here's another piece called, Is That All There Is? And there's a little penis uh, made out of stone that's a gold leaf. And uh, the back of it has, this is a French Limoges, and the back of it has a dollar sign. And is that all there is America? Because as, you know, you would think about our country and what it stands for, it doesn't stand for that. Uh, it doesn't stand for democracy as we've seen. Um, equality, freedom. I mean, there are parts of it, but we're quite contradictory to who we present ourselves to be in the world. So here um, is, are these urn-like uh, shapes but they're actually, which I want to tell you, martini shakers, uh, drink shakers. So I like to take things and that look like things and use them in my work and imply how I see it. There are, le there's lettering on there. I don't know how, if you could see it, but it says America and there's shredded uh, dollar bills on it. And the title of this piece is There Is My Country. And it was done 2018 to 2019. So this was prior to the pandemic. Um, moving into the pandemic, one of the uh, early pieces I did was Beyond the Trail of Tears. And Harriet Tubman is one of my heroes. And I chose to put her on the $20 bill that has been controversial and, uh, and putting George Washington on a little one, well, he's on this, he's on little $1 bills. And um, this is called the end to white supremacy. And this is also a digital print as a composite and it's on, on archival paper. Um, during the pandemic, I noticed um, if all of you uh, get art card or know about art card, it gives you uh, the listings of galleries uh, openings. And all of a sudden as, so here is the very last uh, one or two that were, that gave us the, dates of the openings, actually the last one, that there were galleries listed and then there were no galleries listed. And our card kept present, sending out the email to me, to everyone about gallery, uh, the gallery uh, openings, but there was nothing listed. And then finally in, let's see, uh, April 7th to the 13th, they stopped sent, that was the last time they sent out an email until galleries opened up. So this is, uh, this uh, art is not canceled. And it really talks about how uh, artists will still do their work and galleries might not be around and galleries come in and out of existence. And I use that in other, in my evidence of being series, but yeah, artists will survive. They will find a way to keep going at making art because this is just what we do. And you can see there's a, some masks that I made. Um, do you see these pretty large on your screen? If anybody could tell me. It's about half or two thirds. It's as large as it happens when it fills with the other uh, people. So it's more. Right. So, because I don't know if you want me to, uh, I'll just like go through some of them. And Sounds this. Good. 
you know, hope for a better future, hope for world peace. This is a notorious RBG when she passed away. I think I, I did one before she passed away and I did one in honor of her when in a memorial memorialized it for her. But this is all in honor of her. Um, this piece I did for uh, a show specifically and I have done drawings with lines and uh, I made this particular one that has iridescent uh, oil ink on it um, for a particular project that uh, has been going on in different places. Um, I don't wanna get into all the places I, all my work is, but uh, if you have any curiosity, it's on my, oops. It's on my website. And uh, this is America and it's very subtle. Uh, I use resin. As you can see the drippings of the resin, it's plastic, it's uh, digital print. These are bunting flags that are used for, uh, that actually represent death. And I used it in uh, America 2018. Um, you could pretty much see how I thought about the uh, Trump election <laughs> and what has been going on the last uh, prior to Biden. Uh, this is another piece that uh, Hope for World Peace and another mask I made and I used uh, one of my uh, resin heads and it's called Perils. And this piece is actually going to be shown in Italy, and it is a digital print. Uh, and that's also per that's Pearls 2021. This piece just was uh, re uh, I re I do a lot I redo a lot of my work if it hangs out long enough or not even long enough, and then I don't want to I don't think it works fully. So this piece I redid and. I put it, I put it on its on an angle, and I have drippings on the wall. Well, a drip on the wall, or some drippings on the wall, and that's bearing witness. Arlene, let me ask you a quick question. Sure, please. So what what artist would you say you respect, or you respond to, or you feel akin to? In, sure, you know, in, in, whether contemporaries or even through art. Yeah, I know there's a woman that I adore her work and. Harriet, oh God, she's a Chicago woman uh, artist. I am really, you should have told me I would have wrote their names down. I'm so bad with names that I, and I go blank. So Harriet, uh, and Kate, I sent you her link because I loved her work so much and her work, I really, well. That's okay, friend. I, Babs, Babs Rheingold says, wonderful work, Arlene. Huh. Do you make the pedestals? in the pieces or those purchased or found. I love the martini shakers. They look like urns, powerful pieces. Thank you. So uh, the pedestals, uh, what? So the urns were bought uh, and I do buy, you know, if I see objects like in this, in uh, Bearing Witness, I bought the um, globe but the rest, the um, this I had cut out for me because I don't have woodworking uh, laser material to laser cut this. Uh, I did buy the flag. I did cut up the flag. I did tint the flag, uh, but the arm I made and uh, what else is on here that I made? Uh, and then as the assemblage. Um, the pedestals, if you're referring to, uh, my, uh, oh, these pedestals you're referring to. Yes. So uh, this is part of uh, where Liberty dwells. And uh, these pedestals, some of them I made, let's see if I have any of them that I made on here. I think most of them I have on the website were the ones that were bought. Let me just see. Yes. 
Uh, but I do have, huh. This one was made. Well, actually it was both made. Part of it was made, the top of it was made. I painted it, I patinaed it. And uh, this one's different than the other ones. And this one's made out of wood. The other ones are made out of brass. And I did buy them. And the bottom of them, so the pillow sits on them and the underneath there is a base that I made to sit into the uh, brass stand. So it, it has some working of my hands and, uh, but particular this uh, series, a lot of the pieces I bought intentionally and reworked it and used it as um, showing, uh, oh, what's the, like things that you, trinkets, like souvenirs that you would buy in a store, like these kitschy objects. And um, so some of them I bought and, but I have to rework them. Like this was an airplane that I had to gold gild. I put the United States of America on it, even though it was on it. When I gold gilded it, I had to put uh, different lettering on. Arlene, am I right to say your use of gold lines up with your use of torn up money? Yeah, you know, gold is interesting. I, I started using gold um, back uh, when I did the heads and uh, this particular piece, sir, this was shown in Switzerland, 13 gold heads plus. So instead of using the last supper, that title, I used 13 gold heads plus and you, it looked into a mirror and you were able to see yourself in the mirror with, and you were the plus and it was in a project space on the ground floor in Bern, Switzerland, in a gallery that used to represent me. Um, I use the gold for a couple of reasons here. And one is it sort of lacks a specific color in terms of like red, green, blue, primary colors. It represents uh, some something regal, but I was also able to make it very antique it to a, and patina it to a point that it looked like it was, uh, the head was aging. Oops, that's not what I wanted to show you. So I used it to have some sort of uh, worth, but also to show it um, disintegrate, something that disintegrates. So it has both things going on at the same time. So it has value, but it also shows that things go out of existence or deteriorate in time. And, uh, and the same thing with the, uh, where Liberty dwells, because this echoes the 25th Amendment. And uh, well, I did a, initially for the 25th Amendment. And so it, it brings like value to something that maybe doesn't have value. And these are children uh, are the future. And this had a lot to do with uh, the immigration uh, status and we were holding them in captive, you know, with the wall and- Arlene, let me read a few, few more comments and then open it up to a question or two and we'll move on. Uh, to another artist. Babs says, uh, I love the use of Babs Rheingold. I love the use of the different materials. I know you cast a lot too. Jill Derwitz says, wonderful work, Arlene. Oh, thank you. I think we're all responding. Strong work. You almost sound like you're guilty for using things if you didn't make it. I think it's great when you steal from Red <laughs> whether you manipulate them or not. They're very powerful when you mix them in the way that you're doing. Um, uh, I do want to say, uh, I'm going to stop. Who said that about uh, almost guilty? Uh, I like that. Who said yeah. that? I did. I did. I sort of feel like. Uh, you know, I, you're right. Because I, and it's funny that you say that because I do make everything and I almost feel guilty. 
like, you know, when I appropriate things, uh, but I, I've done a lot of appropriating like the toilet paper rolls and, you know, during the pandemic and cardboard toilet paper, uh, not the rolls, but, you know, cardboard toilet paper. They're actually good material. I've actually used them myself. They are fun. Thank you, Arlene. Thank You're you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Very nice presentation. Um, we're going to move to uh, Kate uh, Fauvel. Kate, welcome. Welcome to Artist Talk on Art. And everybody, this is the ATOA, Artist Talk on Art. We meet every Monday. And down the road, shortly, we will be meeting in person. We'll let you know through our website and our e-blast, atoanyc.org, for anything you'd like to know about the ATOA and if you'd like to contribute. So, Kate, welcome. And tell us where you're from. Uh, this is going to be exciting. I know we're headed for a studio tour. You are in your yeah. studio. Um, thank you so much, Barry, for having me. And thank you, Mitch, for the invitation. Um, thank you, Arlene, for sharing. So I'm in my studio. It's going to be um, a little bit different. Um, I'm going to just take you through what I've been working on um, since the pandemic started. So I am born and raised in New York City. Um, I'm from Queens originally. I live in Manhattan now, but I've been um, in a bubble upstate New York um, in a large studio space I have up here at my mom's house. Um, so I have a two-year-old daughter and I've been able to keep up my work um, during the pandemic because I've been having the support of, of family. So, um, but, I, but I am so uh, very much like New York City based and can't wait to um, get back home. <laughs> but you'll see my upstate studio here. So I, my background is in painting and printmaking. That's what I studied in school. Um, I, and I moved from that, like I, I was working on a series called 1.1 where I attempted to paint 1.1 million portraits of New York City public school students. Um, I, like that was uh, back in around 2005. Um, and I got close to 30,000 portraits in collaboration with some of the students. Um, and then my, I transitioned into more collage based work um, just by needing more of a direct connection with viewers. So my grandparents passed away in 2013, both of them, and I had all these family photographs and I, I wanted to figure out something to do with them. So I, I photocopied all these old family photos and started building portraits um, from them. So that really started my, my, my collage work. And now I, I would very much consider myself a photo-based collage artist. I take most of my own photographs um, with the exception of that legacy project, it started with old family photos. Um, and, and those old family photos were turned into portraits of people that were um, really like touched by the lives of my grandparents. It was, it was a series that was meant to honor um, and document their lives, like two working class people from Queens. Um, and then from that, from that series, I built an installation of, um, of their house. So I documented every object in their house and and started enlarging the photographs I took to build, uh, basically rebuild their home in a very abstract sense. Uh, that, that series turned into a love letter to my city, um, which is where we'll kind of jump into my studio because the series continued. Uh, I started probably about four or five years ago, the series where I would um, walk around the city on my like daily errands on you know our busy lives, like going from one place to the next and just take photographs of um, everything around, like the, the unnoticed, the buildings, the people, the, the things that we often don't find beautiful, like the everyday, the mundane, um, and turn them into like large scale prints, the photographs they took, and then tear them and rebuild them into these large abstracted collages that I would then hand paint. Um, I don't know if you want to, Bear, do you want to share my screen and I can start to take you around the space a little bit, or should I just... Um, take it. Also, I want to like kind of have a more interactive. So if you guys have something you want to ask about material or process or or a particular series, you can um, unmute yourself and and feel free to ask me. It'll kind of keep me talking more. <laughs> so we're in, my, we're in my upstate New York studio and this year, this piece behind me, I call blue. I'm going to I'm going to kind hey, of very Let's let's share screen. This way, it'll go bigger on yeah. everyone's screen, really easy. Remember, you can always pin a speaker if you want them larger. And there's also 
the chat feature in the side. I, before you, you go ahead and share screen, Kate. I did want to mention there were some other very nice comments. Uh, Audrey Anastasi about Arlene's work said the heads are very emotional. Wondered about the scale, if they were cast or sculpted. Maybe we'll answer that later. Uh, and Babs Rangel said she loved the mix and match and that you shouldn't feel guilty. Peggy Pugh, I love your work and how the images are tied into a thread of thought. thought. Um, so very nice. And everybody, thank you for your kind comments. Kate, are you able to share screen? Um, I think so. I'm not sure if it's working. Cor I might not be able to. Um, I don't see how. I see like share screen, but. Um, press that little green button. And then yeah. usually. Uh, it should be OK. Yeah. Let's see. Sorry, you guys. If That's not, I mean, it's totally fine. I'm happy to look at you guys also while I'm speaking. So I just put mine into speaker view. And then you yeah, get a screen. Yeah, that's fine, I think. Are okay. you talking about sharing screen or, or are you talking about um, um, spotlighting you? Just uh, either one would be fine, but. Well, they're two different things. If you're gonna share screen, you're gonna show us something that's on your computer. But if we're looking at your studio, then yeah. you're talking about Barry spotlighting you. But yeah, people that's... can also just pin you. You're yeah. right, I, I was wrong, I was wrong. Yes, Kate. We will pin you, and if you want, can you bring your sort of uh, screen around with you? Is it a yeah? That's what I'm gonna do. It's a show okay. you guys. So we could just all pin her. It's the okay. three dots next to the mute button. If you hit those three dots, a drop down will come, and you can pin Kate. Or you know, so thank you. We see you now. At least I do larger screen. It's hard. <laughs> So I work in very large scale, as you can see behind me by some of the perspective. This piece behind me is called Blue. Um, it uses photographs from that I've taken all over the city before the pandemic, but I built the collage here. So during the pandemic, I'm going to take you close so you can see some of the details. Um, so there's layers and layers within this collage. So you can see, um, you might recognize some of the buildings, some of the structures. And then as you come back, um, it's more of an abstract piece. Um, I have smaller works hanging um, beside me, which I started doing more of um, because actually Mitch of the USPS project and the, the mailing of a lot of works for different exhibitions during COVID, these large pieces aren't very practical for, um, for shipping or collaborating. So this is the last of the Love Letter to My City series that I've worked on um, since COVID and then once uh, a lot of the Black Lives Matter process started after the death of um, George Floyd, I started making a series of collages that I will show you another large work right here, um, based on photographs from the protests. And for the first time I collaborated with a photographer. So these photos are taken by uh, a colleague of mine all throughout the city during the protests of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and I started a, like a pretty large series that I began um, when, the, when the protest began um, using the photographs of this colleague. So this is a large scale piece. Um, and then there's smaller works. Um, I'll take you around um, like here. And uh, a couple of them are actually out on exhibition at the moment. So you can, you can see a little bit of the scale, right? So this piece is 120 inches by 84 inches. And then this one comes down to 30 by 40. Um, so a lot of my work became more political um, once these protests began. A lot having to do with um, the fact that I have a, bi a biracial daughter um, and I was uh, at home um, staying in a bubble with my mom and my daughter and wasn't able to get out to protest and I wanted to make sure that my mark was left on, um, on this time, right? So that I was documenting and doing something um, even though I wasn't able to get out and hit the streets. So a lot of my work became focused on um, these images from the Black Lives Matter movement um, so that I would have an answer to my daughter when she asked me what I did during this time. Um, so you can see some of the works and then these are some of the smaller images I can get a little bit closer so you guys can see. Um, let's see. 
these are about six by six and some of them are four by six, but they're all like more mailable sizes that really started with the USPS project um, that Mitch was talking about. Uh, and some of them, uh, like a, a series I had ongoing at the same time as the Black Lives Matter was uh, Pandemic Dreams of Travel. I had all these images from when I was traveling um, and I started to build some collages thinking of all the places I wish I could be, um, you know, when we were stuck at home. Um, and then I'll show you another part of my series and then an overall Kate, you some of the responses have been uh, Olga Alexander says awesome political statements without being didactic. Mm -hmm. Denise Kazura says beautiful. That's a nice way to express. Mm -hmm. uh, Fran Bueller, the big collages look very turbulent, like an earthquake or an explosion. Is that intentional? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. So yeah, let me let me sort of bring this as the backdrop and we can maybe talk a little bit. So um, a lot of yeah, a lot of a lot of the turbulence is intentional. Um, you know, I, I and if you you can take a look at my website too and see the love letter to my city series, which is the same scale. So it's these like the same sort of eight by um, 12 foot pieces and they all have this sort of chaos or turbulence in them. and. And it is to represent the, like the inside of what's going on in the city or what's going on with the movement, right? So to me, like the physical is very important. So they're large because I need, because I need to move. They're torn because of like the roughness that I think like exists in the world and in our life. And because of the way that I am, I'm kind of messy and um, authentic. So I kind of bring the outside, bring the inside out. Um, yeah. So that's, I think that's a great question. Uh, um, also, Olga Alexander says, I love the scale of these, Kate. They are so arresting. And there is something to just a torn image. There's something to that being very strong. And the space between that you use, you use that very well, the negative space in there between the assembled uh, pieces. Um, there's, for me, there's like an importance of the abstract and the real. I started using photographs because I felt like I wanted to connect with people more. And my paintings were, were never as, uh, as direct as some of these images are, right? So, so if you look at the torn spaces within, you'll also see some political commentary alongside of like images of the Brooklyn Bridge or, or like some graffiti in buildings or like some beautiful garbage I photographed on the street. Um, so there's layers and layers of these large photographs just sort of torn and built into um, these larger pieces. So they're super heavy and, and actually super durable, but at the same time, um, you know, somewhat. Do you use uh, paint also? Are they painted on top I of the do, photo? Yeah. Yeah, so they're so I collage first and then I seal them and paint them after. Yeah, it keeps it hold on to my like love of paint. Um, like that's my foundation is this like really, really love of that. That was my question too. Yeah, that that pulls it together by doing the painting on top of them. That's very interesting the way that you're that you're doing combining the two mediums. I like that too. But Fran, that was my original question too. So, so I have a comment and a question. Sure, go ahead. Okay, um, I've had the privilege of seeing them in person and they are really dynamic and they have a fabulous presence. And um, I guess my question is sort of a follow-up to the other people. And that is, you mentioned using photographs. I was curious if you don't mind saying who you collaborated with, but even more so, are you mentioned Xerox? Are they mostly Xerox? And you know, what's your process uh, to get to these fabulous dynamic presences? Yeah, sure. So this one, this blue one, is all photographs I've taken. And then the with these and all the smaller works are with Moni Carboni. She's actually works in theater and she does a lot of 
um, theater photography, but she's out on the streets and documents New York in this beautiful way. And she happens to be a friend who was posting all these photographs while I was sort of in my bubble. And I just asked her if she wanted to collaborate and she was so um, interested in it because she didn't feel like that's not her primary method of like of work. She's like, she does uh, set design and she does different kinds of photography, but she had just done a beautiful like body of work from COVID. And so, so she's, her name's Monique Carboni. If you see her on, you can follow her on Instagram. She has beautiful photography. Um, and then, so what I do is I print these photographs in Xerox. Like, I think, you know, a little bit, Audrey. So, so I have them printed like 24 by 36, mostly sometimes 18 by 24. And I, I lay them out and sometimes like begin from the like start from the beginning just tearing them sometimes i have an idea like with these with the black lives matter images i really wanted this like dense population of bring uh, of people and bringing together this movement like to really have a power of the people so i, I brought together different like images from different protests and and pulled them in um so some of it is like starts off very direct where I start with one image and then I begin to tear the other photographs apart and rebuild into uh, an image. And then sometimes it's more planned, but for the most part, it's it's a very instinctual um, building and then rebuilding. I sort of have this like uh, nothing is permanent kind of idea of, so, okay, I'll glue all this stuff down. And then if I hate it, I'll just like build on top of it and keep going. So. Um, but yeah, they're just 18 by 24 or 24 by 36 Xerox black and white images that I have printed mostly from photos from my iPhone or these Black, black Lives Matter images are from my friend Monique. Um, and then I work with them from there. And the smaller, I think a lot of the smaller works actually are really powerful and have been really connecting with people. Um, I, I, can, I can attest for that. I mean, Carol Orito says explosive and dramatic images evoking pain and fear of the time. Arlene Rush loves the torn edges. Wendy List says powerful and symbolic work. Um, uh, many positive comma comments. Denise Kazura, when you work with your family photographs, old analog images, do you use the original photographs in your collages? No, that's when I started doing um, Xerox copies uh, of them also. Um, but but just so that I could tear them up because uh, like the like I, I need to be able to be pretty rough with my materials that's part of part of why there's the torn images and if you look at the edges you can see like um, some of the details that are really really rough and and come out of these but the for the um, yeah for the family photos no I copied them and used uh, and used prints of them and what are you uh, uh, Lynn Stein asked what are you mounting the collage on? Are you going on canvas or? Yeah, they're on canvas and so the smaller works are on uh, panels, but the larger works are all on canvas. Well, you work very well both scale. The large work everybody's responding to, those small works were really precious and we're using the things that only a small work can do, just like your large works, using the things that only a large work can do. So you're talented to be able to switch between scales. Also in your large work, if you look at the micro of the work, it's busy and complex. Whereas you look at the macro, it somehow comes together through your sort of uh, running lines, your sort of uh, lava flow lines. Thanks, Barry. Yeah, I, I hope that the, the larger works kind of pull you in to see the detail and pull you out to see the overall image. And then in the smaller works, I find I get more detail in the painting. So even though they're collage, I go back in with a lot of more, a lot more fine detail of brushwork. Um, and the, and the, the larger images I find are actually about the, the kind of the pieces to the puzzle that are built by the, by the collage themselves. Fran Beeler asks on a practical level, where do you get your extra large photocopies made or you print them yourself if you have a large copier? Yeah, so I actually get them done at the village copier. Um, yeah, <laughs> I've been working with them for a while. I, I one like I hope to have a printer, but sometimes I think it's it's about the same, you know, cost wise to have your own printer. They're pretty. They work with me like pretty well. They're a great um, shop if you guys don't know about them, um, and they are really supportive of artists. So I have a, a good relationship with them. 
I imagine a scene out of the what uh, the Wizard of Oz at the end. You know, they find Oz and they go and they pull the screen back, and there's like a 58 inch printer there. Yeah. All <laughs> I have one. Uh, I wanted to make a comment about the piece that's behind you, uh, Kate, that uh, you have. It, it looks like these people are coming down from the mountain or something, and the mountain has all these cracks. And I wonder, do you intend that? Do you even think about any of those kind of things when you're putting this all together? Uh, or is it just uh, intuitive? How, how, how do your images come about in a way, I guess, or your compositions. Is there a thinking like that? Because especially with this being all the protests and that and this mass of, I feel like there's this mass of people towards the bottom and then you have all these lines that do feel, I think it was Fran who mentioned that said it feels a bit like an earthquake. Uh, it feels like it's uh, broken up or something's happening at the top. How do you come about that? So a lot of it is very intuitive, very instinctual, but I feel like uh, the energy of the, the imagery like combines with my physical energy to make the work and something starts to happen and then I, I sort of navigate it, right? So to me, it's like, it was a mountain or waves, really like waves, but, but I was just attracted to the white, the, the movement of the white, right? So like the coming up into the sort of wave of explosion and the dense population of people below but it was it wasn't I didn't have an, a visual aesthetic when I was making it it was very natural to the images that I selected to build a piece so I I saw like very naturally this white half this white movement happening with just the placement of some of it and then, then I decided to extend it because I thought that the movement of the mountain or the wave was really significant in the in this piece as as a piece dealing with like the protest so it's probably a combination of my aesthetic values but but instinct first you know and like intuition first um, a lot of it is definitely based on the physical material and then the the abs the movement that i want to see through it through the through the piece um, and then like just movements of like in the same with this one it's like i felt an attraction to the um to the black Right, like this whole happened, which feels like very much sort of an explosion in a different way. But these, but I like the movement of the white through the piece. So there is like an abstract, I think I have abstract values along with the political, you know, there's a combination of my thing to um, do political work, but also include abstract values. I would like to say, uh, Denise, uh... Kazura says, I'm looking at your website and your work is great. Um, feel free anybody to share your website as well. And Regina uh, Greatest uh, says, great protest energy. That's a nice compliment. Uh, go ahead and share something else. We'll open up to a question or, or two more and then we'll go on to Bob Clyatt, who I think we'll find some of his work with heads is actually similar to Arlene Rush's work, which is a nice coincidence. It's always, always happens like that. Uh, but you're doing great, Kate. And thanks for having us in your studio and, uh, you know, responding to all the questions. Yeah, thank you for all the questions. It's always really, um, really fun to talk to people. Um, this is, I can show you like something that's in the middle of, of, of like being worked on that is sort of at a beginning phase. So you can see that the layers are still being built. And I'm actually using some broken ceramics in this to, to develop texture, which I don't know that the texture translates through, but texture is a really important element in my work um, with the layers of collages. I, I can kind of, I don't know if you see it coming close, but there's like um, the, the layers of the paper and the glue and the canvas make these really sort of uh, imperfect textures that are actually really important to to my work. So, yeah. Did anyone have any other questions? Gallery view. Well, mm -hmm. let's say thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I really appreciate you listening. <laughs> you know, I think you're right about texture. I don't think we can get that through a computer screen. You can see edges yeah. things, but in person, the light on it, I, I think you lose 99% of it when you go to a screen. 
Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your time, everybody. I, I do. Yes. I have, I have one question. Um, your your pieces are so detailed. When you show them, do you notice how long people stand in front? When I go yeah. to art exhibits, I notice that some people will go through the entire thing in 10 minutes and then I know. spend an hour talking to each other. You know? Yeah. I go well, through it in two hours. <laughs> I hope I hope to make the work that people want to spend time with. You know, because that's that's um I think that sometimes our attentions are shorter these days, but my hope is that it draws you inside. So sometimes I think people do spend time, they're really large, so there's a lot to look at. And I think the scale forces you to have a, like to be inside of them. You know, especially when I was building these rooms of collage, there was a lot of um, conversation about the details that were in them. So people were really paying attention to small, small parts of them. Good. So. You know, I hope that with these more abstract ones that people do the same because there's a lot of images that I've selected, a lot of places I photograph that are intentional and important that if you look at the piece for, you know, 30 seconds or what's the average, isn't it like 52 seconds or so? I don't know. There's some like really short average for what people spend looking at artwork. But if you look a little longer, you'll see more of the intention of the piece. And, and a lot of it is this like archive. I wanna make an archive that of, of people important to me, of places important to me, of our ever-changing time. Um, so I hope that people spend a little bit of time looking at it and, and, and remembering you know, and connecting mm -hmm. and, and seeing things. Yeah. It, um, it's lovely. And uh, Thank you so much. were I in front of it, I would probably feel myself drawn in physically. Yeah, right into we'll, it. we'll be in person together. That would be really great. Amen. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. Very nice. Thank you, Kate. Um, Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. Um, let's uh, move on to Bob Clyatt. Bob, welcome. And again, everyone, artists talk on art every Monday for now, virtually, uh, new things coming as things hopefully continue to get better. Uh, Bob, welcome, and where are you coming in from? Uh, hi, Barry. Um, from the studio you saw way back when, um, but I'm in Rye, Rye, New York. I like that studio. And I, I will point out, I hope you get to show us some of your heads, because Arlene showed us a series of 10 heads in gold, and I'm like, Oh boy, yeah. this is a nice link to Bob. Uh, I, lo I love him. Well, uh, and I think there'll be a few things that that also where I, I went into a, a digital, sorry, a sculptural collage at stage two. So I, I think I've, I've both Kate's work and Arlene's work have been influences on me and and have been been areas that I've I've plumbed um, in my work. And uh, so I think it'll be it'll be a nice way to bring those together. Let's um, let me just jump in, and I'm gonna go ahead and share screen um, if I can. And let's see, make sure I'm in the right place. Sounds good. I do want to point out we've had no technical difficulties tonight, so you know what that means, Bob. It's oh, look at that! It's impressive. <laughs> it takes. So let's see. Um, I'm gonna. I hope that you're seeing this, and that I can. It looks great. It looks great, Bob. Okay, so um, I, I thought I'd sort of take you down a little bit of, of, of a journey. And I, I think this has been a useful chance for me to reflect on, on 20 years of my own sculpture making and, and, uh, and a process that is evolving. And that, so we can go to with some old things and, and we can start to see some of the concerns that I've been wrestling with all this time and how over the years I come at them from different angles and and, uh, and we see them in different pieces in different ways. So um, I have a little bit of a different background than most, um, most artists maybe at, well, the same we started out, all I ever wanted to do was create art, um, but a, a fateful chat with dad when I was about 20 uh, pointed me in a different direction, which was to go out and be responsible with my life. So I did try to do that. And I, I did spend 20 years earning living in uh, you might call it the world's longest day job 
Um, but I did that. And um, during that time, I went to MIT. And uh, what does an art artist do when they get to MIT? I studied innovation um, and the process of innovation. And we went around with clipboards going to all those those offices uh, recording who did what, who talked to whom, uh, whether any good ideas came out of it. And then that sort of was the theoretical foundation for those Silicon Valley cool office spaces that people are in now. Um, but I started a design firm and uh, that really uh, allowed me, which we ended up selling to a public company and that ended up allowing me to get back full time to creating art and that's, Sculpture came to me at that time. I'm not sure if I'm unusual in this, but sculpture for you know for older people. I was 40 when I when I started sculpting, and and I felt like I just I had a a different perspective than maybe I, my 20 year old self had had. So I I had lived in Japan, and I'm going to go back one. Um, I was very involved and interested in. Uh, Buto, which is a sort of a performance art movement. And I think having absorbed all that Japanese ceramics and, and things while I was there, um, some of the first work I was doing in those years, early years, was to sort of translate some of this ceramic and figuration. I was always interested in figuration uh, together. So this, was, this is a piece um, called Dream Carriers. And um, this piece that we saw earlier, Standing Figures, um, here's one. So these were all Raku fired stoneware figures from that era. Bob, I just have to point out if, if I'm looking at four or five foot figures, how hard it is to do this in ceramics. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, that was, I, well, I think I mentioned that MIT side, there was a side of me that really was into figuring out the engineering side of this stuff, the craft aspects of it. Um, you know, coming up with glazes and firing things. There's an awful lot of that and, and the design side and the art side. And I, and I wrestle with them in different ways at different times in my, in my career. But you, you see, you'll see a big craft element and a, and a sort of a, a modeling element in all these works, which I'm, I'm lost to give up. Um, because I, I really like that side of things. So it sort of finds its way into the work. Um, these were some hanging figures. Those are each about 40 inches. Um, that's out at the uh, last frontier. If any of you know that space, Stoll Kyok space out in Greenpoint, we, when we first got that space. Um, and, uh, but at some point, I guess about 2011, this this showed up. I don't know if you can see my my cursor or not, but this little smartphone in her hand. But this is a three graces, which is a, a very classic kind of blended in with uh, with another painting of the Estre sisters. And I was just seeing, I was seeing smart. I was I wanted to kind of find ways to take this very classical and old figuration and bring it up to date. So the first thing I did was with this work and um, so she's texting and that one eventually led to this piece um, which is which is born a thousand selfies no exaggeration um, as just another way to to let the figure become contemporary and and say something about where we are but I gave up figuration for a long time um, and that's actually when Arlene I was sharing space in Arlene's studio there in Chelsea. And I really wanted to find a way to do, to, to, to make sculpture more spontaneous, more contemporary, and yet still have really interesting, tangible forms that you can, you can really kind of get your fingers into. Um, so I went through a series of wall relief works um, that um, th this one was, uh, was on display in Venice during the biennial two years ago and will be at the Seychelles Biennial as soon as they get around to having that. It's been postponed twice now. Um, so that there's sort of this blend of, of all these contemporary elements um, and, and it, it's, it's good sculpture, but it's also saying things that I found it very hard to do if I was just modeling. So there's a lot of 3D modeled objects and other, other things that I've 
trolled the internet and found them and ex turned them into 3D printed things and pressed those into clay and then cast these works in a, a sort of blend of ground Carrara marble and super hard plasters. Um, and I did, yeah, this, this is a bigger one, Rhizome it's called, and that's where I, I, I felt a connection to some of what we were seeing from Kate's work um, with these sorts of explosive um, compositions um, and, and, and recognizable elements. No, definitely you have the <laughs> micro detail in there and then the overall macro composition is uh, uh, very reduced, uh, very linear and uh, you know, even the wave lines, uh, they're all similar. Yeah. Yep. Thanks. That's, that's, uh, that, those were all, all some of those ideas, Barry. This was about four, three and a half feet wide, um, this piece. So uh, that ended up sort of culminated with a series of American flags where we went around the country. I went to 10 different uh, communities around the country, worked with local nonprofits, and uh, invited people to bring. Um, objects that were meaningful to them, and we pressed those together into a clay ground of the stars and stripes um, that I had had prepared. Um, so this one was done in Berkeley, California. Um, this is ending up in the summer of 2019. El Paso, Texas, a, a farm community in Greencastle, Indiana, um, South Side Chicago with uh, with. Uh, 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 large numbers of school children um, through a, a project with the schools. Um, and there we did one in Mount Vernon and Greenwich, Connecticut, and just as, uh, down in a little town in the border of Alabama and, and Georgia, um, El Paso, Texas, uh, industrial places. It was it was a great way to see the country and these flags are fascinating. And uh, most of those then were gifted back to the communities that they were created in. Um, I have the Berkeley one because um, they said, you know, that's okay, you can have it. But I, I do want to bring all these together uh, in some national exhibition and that'll be, that's a project when all this settles down. But I came back from that, all those years of doing those wall reliefs and said, okay, I think it's time to get back to the figure. And this is the first piece that I created when, when I came back from that sort of four years not having done anything figurative. Um, and it was this idea that we would we carry all these things around, all these elements that were in those, those flag pieces and they're so indicative of contemporary life. We bring them together, we carry them around and they somehow create or some sort of identity. So I had this idea of a basket, a way of taking a figure, a portrait of someone and, and letting that person pile all these things into it that would be a way of talking about them. And so it's a way of making old traditional, slow handcrafted, hand modeled sort of sculpture um, also sing and live in the same way as a collage or a painter might have uh, be able to. So that was one approach. I'm trying try lots of different approaches. By the way, I'd always been doing some portraits early on. Um, this is one of, I don't know how many people know Saul Unter, but Saul is a, a figure around New York collecting scenes and people might have met him. But this sort of highlights the problem, which is it's it's old and it's it's old in, in most ways. You know, I do have a nice, a nice uh, patina that might be new, but otherwise it's just so traditional. How do we how do we move past that and move to something a little more interesting? So one approach I thought was let's let me collaborate with another another artist. And so I did some pieces with Sybil Charlier. Uh, who's um, uh, a New York artist? She's up. She's from uh, from Haiti originally, um, and so we sort of I would talk about it. We talk about it, and I would sculpt the basic foundation, and then she would accessorize and add on um, um, things to that. So in this case, she created all the that hair and and the, that cheap cigar. Uh, this is Guede, which is one of the Haitian uh, pantheon uh, voodoo, voodoo pantheon. Um, the god of the underworld. Um, and it was, it's fun. Like Sybil and I did three of these. I'll, I'll show them to you. This was Zuli. Zuli is the goddess of love. And, and Sybil's concept was to take my sort of Baroque, Baroque foundation and create all this sort of beauty and flowers and, um, and other, uh, 
other accoutrement around it. And that, so it's sort of, it's just another way of trying to say, how do we, how do we blast open this, this old traditional sculpting way? Um, this was another one that we did. I do want to read a few comments. Uh, Arlene sure. Rush says, these are wonderful, Bob. Uh, Babs Randall echoes that thought. Wonderful work, Bob. I love the hanging figures, powerful pieces. Yes, powerful. And, uh, you know, just the danger of a ceramic piece hanging like that. And of course, your use of the crackle glaze. And uh, I can't stress how hard it is in Raku, in Raku firing, to know what you're going to get or to get a full piece out like that. Um, Fran Beeler, great to hear about and see the chronology of your work over time. Love your use of contemporary elements in your classical images. Um, Arlene Rush remembers you doing that ambitious project. It was so great that you love doing it and gives you much credit for it. Um, in both, uh, Den Denise Kazura points out, in both Kate and your work, there is worry about the present. And I do want to address those figures you did. They are beautiful, but there's a feeling. Talk to me about the emotions. I do want to say Gunnar Mundheim says, amazing work, Roberto Bernardi, fabulous. Talk to me about the emotions that you choose in those figures. We're talking heavy, deep uh, content, yes? There, there is, and, and uh, you know, I've, I've wrestled with that too, um, uh, you know, and, and I've spent a lot of time studying the various philosophical uh, traditions and seeing where that comes from. But it's in there. I mean, I think maybe it's it's just how I look at I look at the world as uh, as a as a flawed and difficult place that that we still try to hold up and find some joy through. Um, but I did want to respond to uh, the person who, who knew something about Raku. I, I can't remember who, whose comment that was, but it, yeah, you 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 got the nail on the head. I mean, these are difficult difficult uh, pieces to have emerge at the other end of that process you 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 create this work and you hand it over to the fire uh let's like sending your baby off to war um it's it's a um but the ones that come back with their scars and so on are are, are beautiful in in their own way but some of them some of them don't make it there were there what you see on these pictures are the survivors for sure um let's jump ahead because um Time is short, and I want to be respectful. Um, this is another um, uh, co-portrait. I call these the co-portrait series, where I team up with another artist. Some of you may know Caitlin Copenhaver, um, and uh, she, so I sculpted her portrait. In this case, it was it was uh, a re really a likeness of her, and then she took her um, some of her imagery that she'd been using in in different um, film projects and other projects. Um, kind of urban intervention projects, and we projected it onto the head um, in ways that that created a new meaning, a new a new meaning, and kind of reflected on this identity of a portrait, of a classically sculpted portrait created by another person, created by a guy, a sculptor, whatever, and that that then you know is is claimed back and owned and somehow you know given a whole new meaning. Um, by the quote unquote subject of the piece um, and as, as a way of collaborating. It's, I have to tell you, collaborating is an exciting, uh, exciting thing. And I, I, I haven't only scratched the surface of it. Um, I, I, I'd like to do more, it's, a, but it's, it's tough. So where do these go? Again, trying to, trying to recontextualize these, the human head, the classically sculpted bust, which is kind of where all my focus is now on the head. Uh, to recontextualize it, this brings a conversation um, together between these two um, heads and figures, uh, Caitlin on the left there, and then with, with one of those uh, flag studies in the background um, is as an installation, as one way of doing it. I'm, I look at lots of different ways of, of trying to bring that head together. This is really where my work is now. Um, this was a commission for Big Collector in Minneapolis. Um, that we talked about over a course of a couple of years and created this. And so I've, I've, it allowed me to really explore, and I'll go back and forth between these, these two, because they go together um, on flank either side of, of uh, a fireplace in his, 
home. Um, and I so I got into this day glow cast resin, sort of translucent. Uh, in this case, it's it's I designed and actually I think it was on art, the New York Artist Circle. I actually showed my original drawing that sort of day after I made it. Um, Fran, Fran and some others are here. Audrey, Audrey um, was I designed a sort of scaffolding, and then I had a three D printer make these clips, and uh, and then I used pencils, so I you know made molds of pencils and cast those. And this idea of anyway, in this case, a, taking a classically sculpted head. In this case, we have. Um, uh, Michelle Obama on the left side and Oprah on the right. Uh, his his goal was to have a sort of professional, um, executive, uh, strong black woman, and this idea of being of being uh, a work in progress, a some a a construction project, something that we as a as a society and culture are building, and not just waiting around hoping it'll happen. Um, and then this piece, which flanks it, which is also with this idea of tools, and you'll see those come up in a, in a piece soon. So during COVID, there were no more models. What was, what was I going to do uh, without a model? And so I decided I had to look in the mirror and face up to the most challenging person you'll ever collaborate with, which is the guy on the other side of the mirror. Um, and um, so I, I sculpted myself once each month starting in April, the one on the left uh, of 2020, May, June, July, and August as they move from left to right, and sort of taking originally a, a, a decent likeness um, of me, I guess, as much as I can tell looking straight on and looking at pictures I've taken. But to try to capture the mood, the emotional tenor of where I was that month, and in some sense offload it and just pile it in, um, and it, I realized it could be a series as I was just doing these one a month and they are a, a month's worth of work. I mean, there's it's just a lot that goes into the um, the modeling of something to get it to this to this degree of refinement, um, old fashioned way. And then, and then uh, you have this spray of old masks and paper towels and Clorox wipes and so forth, all kind of piling up uh, each curator gets to strew these around the bottom. Uh, they're up now in uh, White Plains at the uh, Arts Westchester, a beautiful space um, in a show full of work created during COVID. Um, and uh, it's an old bank building um, on the Marinick Avenue. If any of you are in White Plains, these are up through the end of August. And then they'll go to a gallery in Southampton on Jobs Lane. Um, where that curator will have a different way of putting them together. But you can sort of see the movement from fear and concern into anger and despair. And it finally by August last year, I think I was standing standing on a beach in, in a socially distanced remote place in New York and able to feel the sun and the wind. And I just, I don't know why I had some confidence that we were going to get through this thing and we were going to, we were going to find a way through it. So that was a sort of a, a movement um, through that. And another way of me to try to bring a, a fresher context to this. This is the newest and last piece of my presentation. Um, just another way of taking that, um, this idea of tools, a funnel uh, showed up in this one. Uh, where I'm casting those again in that Diglo resin and uh, experiencing the feeling of, you know, a person who's maybe feeling, feeling that the world uh, is, is working on them um, as the world does and what that might feel like in that or that experience of it. So that's where I am. Happy to take questions, uh, audio or text, however, uh, you, Barry wants to run this or if if we have any time, uh, read, I'm going to uh, read a couple of questions sure. and then we'll stop sharing screen uh, and sure. I, we'll take some questions. Uh, Regina Greta says, why mono, monocolor on many of the heads? Yeah, um, well, uh, that's a great question. Uh, I guess I've tried everything. I think I might have tried a thousand, possibly a thousand different patinas and glazes and ways of coloring the head. And um, I've settled, I probably have um, a half a dozen go-tos, but um, 
I've settled on these and these newest ones, actually this came out of Sybil's in my collaboration where she really urged me toward it and we didn't do it in, in hers, but I, I listened um, after that. It said, leave these bisque. These are bisque. Um, if you come out of the ceramics world, bisque, everybody knows bisque. It's, it's what comes out of the kiln after the first firing and you, you would never show it, you never show bisque. You, you glaze it or do something to it. And yet from a contemporary art perspective, talking to people who weren't from the ceramics world was sort of like, oh, you know, A, it, it highlights the form well. It lets, it lets the surface and the form kind of activate. Um, and it reveals the material um, in a way that a, a ceramist never would. Um, but I've used other monochrome uh, in, in lots of my work. I, I think as a sculptor, you have to be aware of the form and many ways that we might color or it might be more familiar to a painter, end up, um, end up hiding the form. They end up competing with the form. Um, and so it's, it's been a challenge uh, for me uh, to, to find ways of coloring um, and treating the work that, that support and enhance uh, what's been sculpted. Very nice. I'm going to uh, stop sh screen sharing. Nice. You do it or do I do it? Yeah. I've had it. Uh, that was brilliant work. Really brilliant. Beautiful, uh, emotional, technically swift. You, you went through a lot of different materials, you know, that you loaded a sentence with, with how you got there. But, you know, when you take those four years off and just go to MIT and goof around, <laughs> I understand how you pick up a few things in the art world. It's a really fascinating history. Let me open it up to any questions or thoughts. Uh, Mitch, Mitch Pilnick, who organized uh, this talk. Thank you, Mitch, and also a board member of the ATOA. Go ahead, Mitch. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for presenting. Um, you, you showed, if it was correct, that venue, what was it called, Last Frontier or something? Yes, yes, okay. that's the green point. And who is the curator for that? So that's Sol Kyok space. Do you right, know Sol? I right. think you do know Sol. Yes, you do. In fact, Mitch, I think you insured that event, if I recall. I, <laughs> Just a, a little shout out to our friend Mitch here. You Thanks know, who's so who, uh, if you're ever running an event, this is a guy. So anyway, yeah, I that's the one. That. I think that's where I first met you, possibly. Maybe, that may be how we met. Yeah, that was yours. Yeah, and, and those figures were amazing. The venue was amazing. Um, to see sculpture like that. And <clears throat> I love all art forms, but sculpture is my most favorite. And you were talking before as far as uh, monochrome colors, but I remember, I don't know, a year or two back that you did different colors of your heads and they were fascinating. Uh, I also remember when you had your artwork outside of, what was it, Rye Art Center, was it? Yep. Yeah, yeah, so. That, um, large, that large woman's head. In, the, yeah. in black bronze. And to the audience, uh, if anyone is uh, able to get out to Southampton between now and the first week of August, I highly recommend you uh, go to uh, see Bob's work. Uh, Yubao Marquez, who is the gallerist of Arte Collective, where I originally met a few years ago when you were at, uh, I think, Art Hamptons at the time. Yeah, he was uh, from Bridgehampton then. Yeah, he's, he's fantastic. He's got such great personality. So if anybody is going to be out in the Hamptons between now and the first week, highly recommend you get over to Jobs Lane. Yeah, he's got a, a place for this year. Um, at, he was there last year, too, on Jobs Lane. Um, just a beautiful space. Uh, we feel so lucky to be represented by him. Um, but uh, it was out. There was a nice event over this weekend. It was. It's. He's creating some nice uh, community around that space. So I urge people to, to stop by if they're in the area. Bob, uh, people are responding to your use of bisque. Uh, Babs Reingold says, "I love the bisque. The contrast of the color resin. The bisque works well." Uh, Heidi Lenino, such great works. Love bisque wear. Have you ever done wood firing? Well, yes, he did raku. So. He's well, Raku is is gas, but um, to is that Heidi's question? Yes. Um, yes, I've done a lot of wood firing uh, with Tony Moore up in Cold Spring, New York. If you were looking, it's a kiln that he opens 
two two potters and sculptors, a few sculptors, um, to fire in. So, um, I, you know, I've I've done the shifts. You work in round the clock, feeding wood into those kilns, and there's some terrific pieces. I didn't happen to show any today, but yep. Good. Tony Moore is a great guy. I was going to ask if you knew him. Do you, I, just a quick question. Do you know Steve Montgomery? No, I don't know Steve. That's a good thing. That's somebody you're going to want to know. And uh, your work, uh, you'll appreciate. Uh, I put it in the text. We'll chat later. I want to thank everybody. And thank you, Bob, and uh, uh, all the artists are presenting tonight, Arlene and Kate. And of course, everybody who comes, uh, spread the word. If you'd like to present or talk, send me an email. You can find all the information on our website. Uh, you can see this talk in a few days on YouTube, on our YouTube channel. And again, the link for that is on our website. Um, thanks for being a part of it. Everybody, so many nice responses. Um, I didn't get to read them all, but the point is we are supporting each other. We are a community, we've come together. Uh, many of the themes, all the artists mentioned tonight have been presented before because we, we, we have shared experiences. And I, I like, I think it was Arlene said, Art is a language, and I think we all hone our language. You are all working with deep skills, and you're collaging both with the past, the present, materials, other people, collaborators. It's a nice thing to see. You know, we do work alone, but at times, you know, support and the group is an important thing. And thanks for becoming a part of the ATOA group. Thanks, everybody. So nice to see you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye, Thank you so much. Bye, Arlene. Bye, guys. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Have a good Bye. Night. Bye. Bye. Thank you.